You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind, or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. The second of the Ten Commandments is a prohibition against making an image of a created thing in order to bow down or worship it. Now remember, the Hebrew people have just spent many generations in the land of Egypt, which was overrun with idols and images. They were everywhere. If you go to Egypt even today and look at the ancient ruins, there are temples and idols and statues and carvings everywhere you look. They depict the pharaohs and the gods, retelling their collective stories in which they found their identity. Some pharaohs ramped it up to 11, like, like Ramses II, who loved him some Ramses II. He built statues and shrines to himself right alongside those of Ra and Osiris and Horus. And God's like, stop doing that. But the question is, why? I think there are many reasons God would give this command, but let's look at two. First, it's a little ridiculous to worship the Creator by attributing to Him an image of a created thing. And second, we already have an image of God walking around, human beings, but we'll get to that in a moment. Last time I mentioned Isaiah, I want to draw your attention to what he actually says about the lunacy of idol worship. And it's a longer passage, but it's well worth it. The blacksmith takes a tool and works with it in the coals. He shapes an idol with hammers. He forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and grows faint. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with a marker, and he roughs it out with chisels and marks it with compasses. He shapes it in human form, human form in all its glory, that it may dwell in a shrine. He cut down cedars, or perhaps took a cypress or oak. He let it grow among the trees of the forest, or planted a pine, and the rain made it grow. It's used as fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself, and he kindles a fire and makes bread. But he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. Over it he prepares his meal. He roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I see the fire. From the rest, he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my god. They know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see and their minds closed so they cannot understand because no one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I used for fuel and I even baked bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. So shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Should I actually bow down to a block of wood? Such a person feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, is not this thing in my right hand a lie? God, the creator of everything, cannot be contained within or represented by anything that we humans can make. I mean, God made cows. How are you going to represent him as a cow? God made the sun. How are you going to represent him as the sun? There certainly are things about God's nature that we can learn from his creation, which is what Romans chapter 1 tells us. But any created image will fall short in fully representing God's power and glory. But it's really difficult for us humans to focus on what we can't see. We often need something on which to fix our eyes on. It's, it's one of the attractions and also the dangers of idol, uh, idol worship. I heard a quote recently, but I can't remember who originally wrote it or said it. But it says, the soul takes the shape of that which has its attention. We are increasingly image-based culture. We communicate through emojis, through gifs and memes. I mean, we don't even call. We, well, we don't call. We definitely don't call. But we don't even send text messages really anymore. We Snapchat or we post to Instagram stories. Or we don't read books. We wait for the movie. We don't read magazine articles. We watch YouTube videos. Gathering around the TV to stream Netflix really doesn't look much different in practice from gathering around the household shrine and telling the stories of the gods. 
going to the movies doesn't look much different in practice than making a pilgrimage to the temple. Living in an increasingly post-text, more image-based society leads us to think more strongly that seeing is believing. You can't believe or know or experience that which you can't see. So we create our own gods and form our new religions around celebrities or sports teams or, or even superheroes. And God says, stop it. Because we're supposed to live by faith and not by sight. And also, God already has micro images of himself walking around. Remember on day six, God created mankind in his image and likeness. That makes me think about the time that Jesus was at the temple and some of the religious leaders wanted to trap him. And they asked about paying taxes to Caesar. And Jesus' response is brilliant. He says, show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a Daenerys and he asked him, whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. And he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. You see, first of all, they weren't supposed to have that kind of coin in the temple because of command number two. But then Jesus asks about the image and inscription. If Caesar wants to put his image and inscription on a coin to mark it as his, then give it back to him. But God has placed his image and inscription upon each person. You are not your own. So give the coin to Caesar, but give your life to God. We don't need to create images to bow down to and worship as a representation of God because God has already done that work for us. Not that we worship human beings, but we see each other and know God is present among us. Uh, John words it way better than I can. He says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. See, if the soul takes the shape of that which holds its attention, then let's set our attention on love. May the love we have for one another be the image of God among us. And may we together, in love, fix our eyes on Jesus, the ultimate representation of God with us. Until next time.